Okay, I want to welcome everyone to Georgetown University. My name is Tony Arend. I am the director of the Master of Science in Foreign Service program, and on behalf of MSFS and the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, I want to welcome you all to this panel discussion of the relatively new State Department's Institute on Faith-Based Initiatives. And I want to first turn it over to the Associate Director of the Berkeley Center, Michael Kessler, who will introduce our panelists and welcome us. Well, thank you, Tony. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and happy to have all of you um, with us. I wanted to begin, before introducing um, Mark and Nicole, I wanted to begin with a brief overview of how we got to this point of having an event about a newly created office at the State Department. And Nicole's going to speak a, a little bit more about this standard narrative, but I, I wanted to give it from the perspective of a religious studies scholar, for, uh, and we'll see how well that narrative maps onto a foreign policy professional. The standard line has been that the State Department diplomatic and foreign policy professionals, as well as the wider politi political and policy community, for a very long time didn't get religion. That for a couple of reasons, one of which was the assumed bias that religion was in the decline, that what mattered at a policy level was, um, what mattered at a policy level were not religious concerns. Um, the second was at a very basic level, um, a concern, and you actually see this in, um, in policies in, uh, about engaging uh, religious communities, um, as well as in court cases uh, about different programs, the concern that the community, the foreign policy professionals would run afoul of the Establishment Clause in some fashion by um, having too much intertwining between governmental action and religious communities. That standard narrative is addended with uh, basic facts, which are that religious adherence uh, in some ways has resurged. You heard a lot about this in the literature in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, increasing attention to the way that religion is a motivational factor in social and political activity, including the terrorist attacks of uh, 2001. And on a, from a different angle, the increasing awareness that religious actors around the globe are immense um, resources and, and harness immense social power um, in areas of advancing and making contributions towards human rights and health and maternal well-being and delivery of, of infrastructure aid among um, many other, and, and mitigating conflicts among many other areas. And so in the past 10 years, there's been a kind of resurgence of religion among the literature in, in um, political science, in foreign policy journals, in uh, religious studies scholars obsessing over how it is that we should actually engage with um, our partners in the other disciplines about religion. Um, and governments uh, have increasingly started to pay attention to the role of religion in world affairs. Um, and so this, that, with that as a kind of standard narrative, which of course is contested, um, the, it, the office's uh, creation in August of 2013, the Office of Faith-Based Community Initiatives, seems to be the next logical step in this story. Uh, the official announcement included um, this language about the role of the office. The office reaches out to faith-based communities to ensure that their voices are heard in the policy process, <clears throat> and it works with these communities to advance U.S. diplomacy and development objectives. And then it goes on to recite a number of other offices at the State Department that the office would collaborate with and or um, work with. The three major areas of work the office was um, announced to uh, focus upon were, uh, first, promote sustainable development and more effective humanitarian assistance. Second, advance pluralism and human rights, including the protection of religious freedom. That second one has caused concern among some people about the existing Office of International Religious Freedom, special envoys and others, and what the new office's role would do in relation to 
on the existing apparatus which was congressionally mandated. And third, prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict and contribute to local and regional s stability and security. The office did not come out of um, nowhere on August 7th. There had been important groundwork laid in the 90s with the um, International Religious Freedom Act in 1998 and the establishment of the State Department's Office of International Religious Freedom, as well as all of the ensuing politics around that. Um, more recently, there was a religion and foreign policy working group that was part of the Secretary of State's dialogue with strategic dialogue with civil society that issued a white paper on October of 2012, which one of the four points in that white paper included, quote, to create an institutionalized mechanism through which the State Department and religious communities worldwide might better communicate and potentially collaborate and that will improve understanding of religious dynamics relevant to foreign policy. That it outlines a couple of bureaucratic options, uh, uh, an office that's under an undersecretary or an office that might be independent or an office that is at a more senior level, which is what we, which is what we ended up getting. Um, all of this seems promising. I, at various points uh, throughout uh, this afternoon's discussion, I will ask some questions uh, of my uh, fellow panelists based on uh, some of the criticisms that have been made of the office, uh, some of which were made before the office was even created and were um, actually, I, I, a little humorously to me, um, using the old name that was suggested uh, by the prior administration for the office. And so when it was actually announced, it was announced with a different name and a, a slightly different, actually a substantially different mission than what some of the criticisms had already been um, uh, made. Um, so we'll, we'll get to those um, sets of issues um, momentarily. Let me introduce um, Mark and Nicole. Mark Lagan is a professor in the practice of international affairs and chair for global politics and security in Georgetown University's Master of Science in Foreign Service program. We are in those offices. And an adjunct, adjunct senior fellow for human rights. Dr. Lagan was U.S. Ambassador at Large, directing the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, and serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. He was also a member of the Secretary of State Colin Powell's policy planning staff, focused on the United Nations and democracy and human rights, and on the senior staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He is co-editor of the forthcoming book, Human Dignity and the Future of Global Institutions, and is the author of The Reagan Doctrine, Sources of American Conduct in the Cold War's Last Chapter. He has a BA in government from Harvard and a PhD from Georgetown, in government from Georgetown University. Nicole Bibin Sadeka is the director of the Independent Diplomats Washington office, where she manages ID, the independent diplomats relations with the US government and American foreign policy community. She is also an adjunct professor in Georgetown University's MSFS program. She previous, previously served in the US Department of State from 1997 to 2007 on a range of issues including democracy promotion, human rights, religious freedom, refugee issues, counterterrorism, and human trafficking. Most recently, she served as Senior Director for Strategic Planning and External Affairs for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, as well as Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs. Following her government service, she launched and directed the International Republican Institute's Local Governance Program in Ecuador. She earned her Master's from uh, Georgetown's School of Foreign Service and a Bachelor's degree um, from the College of William and Mary. Both of them know what they're talking about when it comes to the State Department. I don't. So, <laughs> um, a note about format. I've asked each panelist to speak for a few minutes to lay out their thoughts. I'll then engage them in a conversation. I have a few thoughts as well, um, which I'll share, and then I'll we'll engage them in a, a q and A. If you could please double check your noise-making communication devices so that uh, it doesn't um, disrupt our conversation. Okay, great. 
Excellent. I will jump in. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction, and it's wonderful to be here. Um, I would love to just spend my brief time looking at sort of the meta and the very, very tactical. Um, and I will put on my two different hats that I've had at different points as professor of religion and international affairs at MSFS, as well as former State Department bureaucrat, where Mark and I spent a lot of time slogging away at these issues. Um, so let me start with the issue of why, why, not just why the office, but why this issue? Why are we even talking about the fact that we should be engaging faith, faith-based actors, or anything that falls in the religious realm? The truth is 85% of the world is an adherent to some sort of a faith of a, with, that has a higher, um, a higher being that they ascribe to and that they consider an important part of their life. 85% of the world. Of that 85% of the world's population, 75% by according to Pew, uh, Pew Forum's 2012 study, 75% live in a country where they cannot practice their religion freely. So this is something that's impacting a very large part of the society, and a large part of the global society is not even able to practice those beliefs which they hold near and dear to their heart. Okay, As I would say many times to my students, it actually doesn't matter so much to me, what individual people believe in their own personal life at this moment, as much as it does the discussion for this, for this point right now, is if you are an international affairs professional, as everyone at the State Department is, does religion matter to your analysis? Can you do a good job analyzing a situation on the ground and coming up with policy recommendations without understanding something that impacts 85% of the population? Somehow religion has always been this issue that people have said can be put to the side, yet they don't say that about many other issues. They don't say that about someone's economic interests or somebody's, um, if someone's a member of the Communist Party, you would never go into a country that has 85% of the population adhering to communist values and say, well, let's just forget about that because it's not our value. So, I mean, we don't want to really engage that. And heaven forbid that we would then become communist because we are engaging them. I mean, a more logical way would be let's sit down and actually talk to them. You can then leave the room and still believe what you believe, but you're a better analyst by virtue of having engaged what's in, what is moving 85% of the population. Religion is also not just at the heart of many of the problems, although it is at the heart of many of the problems, as we see around the world. It's also at the heart of a lot of solutions. Okay, If you look at what is motivating a lot of people who are working on poverty alleviation, who are working on development, who are working on conflict resolution, who are working on women's rights, who are working on human rights, a lot of them, not all of them by any means, but a lot of them are motivated by their faith, that they believe that inherent in many of those issues, the fact that people should not live in poverty, the fact that people should not be tortured, is a belief that's given by their creator that there is inherent value in each life. You may or may not agree with that, but you need to understand it if you're a part of the international affairs analytical community. So I would put on the table that there's a lot of debate about whether this office should exist or not. Rather than look at whether the office should exist or not, we should ask our ourselves, should religion be on the table at, or not? And I argue that it should be. Um, if you look around the world, look at some of the major issues we have right now, Syria, Iran, poverty alleviation. Just take Syria. Syria didn't start as a religious conflict by any means, but the fact that the lines have been divided, the lines of access, the lines of power, the lines of battle have been divided along sectarian lines, that is a defining factor now. People who are engaging in this conflict are engaging in it along religious lines. It does not mean that people are waking up with their theology books and arguing over what's in them, but it does matter which side you're on based on what you believe. Um, so why did this happen? I mean, Michael, why is it that, that faith has not been a part of how many of the people in the international affairs analytical community have approached this. Michael touched upon many of those issues, which is scholars did believe for a long time that faith would just go away. As we modernize, as we know more stuff, this sort of outdated stuff will just go away. It hasn't. If 85% of the world's population still believes it, it still matters to people. Um, also, there has been this fear about crossing over the line between church and state. I would argue as international affairs professionals in the State Department, 
there's a difference between analysis and belief. <laughs> what the Establishment Clause naturally says is that the state should not promote one religion, but it doesn't prohibit a conversation about religion, a conversation with those people who adhere to religion. Having a conversation about religion in order to just gain intelligence that's going to make you a more effective policymaker. Okay, so um, those fears about the lines being crossed are ones which I think um, are a bit of a, a red herring, I would argue, and a reason that people have used an excuse not to, not to engage. Um, having spent 10 years at the State Department working on a range of issues, including religious freedom, um, and much of the time also with Mark, um, I can say it's not in the State Department's culture, okay? It's not in the State Department's culture necessarily to engage this issue. Um, the State Department has a wonderful training institute called the Foreign Service Institute, FSI. Um, they started last year with their for first course on religion and foreign policy. Last year. That doesn't mean that they haven't had individual courses of Islam in Nigeria, or, but the concept of religion and foreign policy being a part of the training started last year with an optional course, not mandatory, an optional four-day course. So it's not something that the State Department has said, we're embracing this and we're taking this full head on. Okay. So I leave that as the first part, and we'll touch very briefly on the second part. The first part is the meta, which is, does faith matter to international affairs? And the tactical is, how is this office going to fare? Okay, How this office is going to fare is going to be based tremendously on how much support it actually gets from the top. Things in the State Department rise or fall based on what the Secretary said. Secretary Kerry did a wonderful launch on, in August for the office, but what comes down to it is will he stand with this office and push it? Will he ask his ambassadors, have you met with the local imam? Where, where's the religious community doing? How are the faith-based groups that are working on this issue? How are the Catholic churches that are providing 75% of the HIV AIDS issue, you know, training in this country or support in this country, how is that going? If that's a question that's on the agenda, it will rise to the top. <laughs> If it's not on the agenda, it won't. And that's the reality. So I think Secretary Kerry was very, very sincere in his in mission. He has, in his launch of this, he has a lot on his plate. Whether he makes this a priority or not will really be the definer, in my view, of um, whether it goes um, well or not. One thing which I hope we can talk about is also the relationship with the Office of Religious Freedom. Um, they are very separate, and they should be separate. They have very different missions. Religious freedom is um, an issue which is a human rights issue, and it's an issue about providing protection against religious persecution. It is very different than looking analytically and p at what role faith plays in a society and partnering with individuals who are motivated by their faith. They overlap. They are related, but they are not the same thing. So I would love to have that conversation um, as well. So I will leave you with that meta and that tactical to chew on, and then turn it over to Mark to come in. <clears throat> Lots of food for thought. Well, um, religious actors have been very important uh, in um, the US domestic context for a long time. Um, and they've had a, a very positive influence uh, at interesting turns. Um, you know, just take one example. The uh, infamous um, social conservative senator Jesse Helms was brought around to the view that massive U.S. federal spending on fighting HIV/AIDS internationally was something that he would come to support, despite his long-standing views on uh, um, HIV/AIDS domestically, because of Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham. Um, head of a religious organization, Samaritan's Purse. And so one sees influences uh, on the domestic level. But Nicole is right. Uh, Michael is right. It is not the default position of the diplomatic um, service of the United States to be comfortable with religion. And I'll give you an example. When I was a um, deputy assistant secretary for international organization affairs, uh, the UN ambassador for the United States, Jack Danforth, an Episcopal minister uh, before he served as uh, senator from Missouri, wanted to have a dedicated meeting of the UN Security Council on questions of interfaith conflict, the sources of conflict, um, 
that came from faith. And quietly, but uh, quite firmly, Secretary of State Rice squashed that idea. She did not want, think that those issues of religion should be dealt with um, at the Security Council, a traditional view um, of leading diplomats in our country. But it has proven to be the case that engaging issues um, of religion and engaging um, actors in the world um, who define themselves as part of religious uh, communities and identities has proven to be quite helpful, and even from some su uh, surprising quarters. Um, in, in the State Department, it generally has not been seen as a productive thing to engage um, the organization, um, the Islamic Conference in the past, when it had that name, um, as a caucus in the UN, and it has proven to be a very um, helpful thing, to have direct dialogue, to have a, an envoy dedicated for those issues, and even on some of the most nettlesome issues in the UN, such as the debate about re uh, defamation of religion versus freedom of expression um, in the wake of the Danish cartoons um, uh, of the prophet and of the uh, so-called film Innocence of Muslims. Um, negotiation directly with the OIC helped balance between um, claims of defamation of religion and freedom of expression in UN resolutions. Now there's some oddities in the way things get set up in the US government. Um, those things that are created by legislation um, sometimes aren't a perfect architect's plan but a, a, a result of compromises. And so the International Religious Freedom Act of 15 years ago produced both an Office of International Religious Freedom at the State Department and a commission uh, on international religious freedom as an independent watchdog. One of the reasons there's a commission is that House members wanted to have a more onerous sanctions regime on countries of particular concern in terms of religious um, freedom being circumscribed. Senators did not want sanctions, and so part of the compromise was to produce an additional watchdog body. And 15 years later, we've had very productive work by that other body, but it was produced perhaps for other reasons than elegant uh, architectural design. And so too, the latest office on faith-based initiatives reflects policy by czar making, um, creation of a number of envoys, dedicated offices, and czars, including those for public-private partnerships, youth, civil society, over the last two administrations. And so the faith-based office is in that context. Um, and it, it is part of a, um, a me messy pluralism of adding a number of functional issues not within existing um, bureaus, but sort of on top of them. Grant making to faith-based actors is a is tricky business, but also potentially very uh, rewarding. Um, like my uh, valued colleague, Catherine Marshall, I'm interested in grant making related to human trafficking involving faith-based groups. I served as the head of the Human Trafficking Office of the State Department. The narrative for State Department officials, whether a career diplomats or political appointees, is that faith-based um, organizations and groups will be very um, helpful in mobilizing international public support for an issue. For instance, in the case of human trafficking, framing the issue as contemporary slavery. Um, but that when it came right down to you know, programmatic work, that uh, faith-based organizations would make policy based on faith, not based on um, empirical data of what has worked. That's not necessarily the case. I would say myself um, that perhaps one of the most disciplined um, uh, non-government organizations uh, programmatically working in the world on human trafficking is International Justice Mission, a, a faith-based organization. We're left with the question uh, that my colleague uh, Professor Kessler hinted at, um, who taints whom? Does the government taint faith-based actors or do faith-based actors taint the government in this un uncomfortable um, relationship? Well, I actually think that this has emerged as a bipartisan consensus over two administrations in a row. And there are different elements of emphasis, a little more emphasis on, for instance, an anti-prostitution view when it comes to 
um, HIV AIDS or human trafficking policy under the Bush administration, a little bit more emphasis on climate change um, in the Obama administration because thankfully there are uh, progressive evangelicals coming to the table and raising issues on that. But I think we have a robust consensus and the, um, we're, we're learning to live with a situation that, that is not worried, uh, it does not involve deep worry about um, the Establishment Clause or the fact that faith-based organizations will be tainted by government giving them money or that programmatic work promoted by the government will somehow be uh, irreparably biased by faith-based organizations being part of it. Well, you set up what I wanted to say perfectly, so thank you. Um, so I, I want to begin with a quote that I'm going to actually ask you all to comment on as well, but I'm going to attempt one answer, and then I'm going to say, well, even if that's a problem, here's, here's one way that it's not a problem. Um, probably the most um, notable um, critique of the office came from Elizabeth Hurd, um, who's um, across the city at uh, George Washington University. Um, or I'm sorry, she's at uh, Northwestern University. Um, she gives a catalog in a piece in foreign policy on what's wrong, called What's Wrong with Promoting Religious Freedom. Um, she gives a catalog of um, religi about religious persecution around the world and how um, some argue this requires or, or could be helped by um, governmental support. And she says... Surely those groups need international and local support, but not necessarily as, quote, religious groups. Defining religion is no simple task. When the U.S. government uses its authority to promote religious freedom abroad, the government weighs in on what counts as religion and what forms of religion should be protected. When the U.S. officially engages actors abroad as religious, it sets standards that effectively bolster the sects, denominations, and religious authorities that it has defined as benevolent, while marginalizing less desirable counterparts. And she proceeds to develop a, a few points uh, uh, to, to explore this a little further. One, that official religious engagement with religion can harden lines of division between communities by, in fact, imposing certain kinds of categories that are not native to um, those groups' identities. Um, second, that there is less space for diversity in such a world where there's officially governmentally endorsed religion as a de facto matter of foreign policy. And third, that engaging uh, religion requires um, defining it. So this has gelled in some ways to a certain kind of critique that religion as a conceptual matter is, uh, you know, it, it is a um, phenomena that is not easily, that can't really be defined on one end of the extreme too. It can't not easily be defined and all exercises in taxonomy and categorization are modes of imposing um, uh, one group's will on another. And so when a foreign government comes in and says this is uh, the people, these are the groups that we're going to identify with and, and talk to, that that somehow um, is an exercise of imperial power in and of itself. And religious studies scholars uh, of, who take that view certainly do not uh, want that imposition of power, but they think that it runs afoul of certain kinds of um, constraints, particularly within um, the U.S. constitutional scheme. And I'm going to speak to that in a second. Now, on my take on this is a little bit like a as much as I have read all of the literature and uh, love Jay-Z Smith and, and the uh, theory that this comes out of, um, I sometimes approach these things uh, like the little boy from Indiana cornfields where religion matters. And the fact is that on the ground there are groups that are identified and self-identified as groups that wage immense social power and they influence the regimes that the U.S. government is interacting with. And so irrespective of the theoretical debates that we, that we rightly engage in as academics, the reality is that when entering into a, a nation, uh, there are social groups that are identifiable. Um, they may be more fluid than our categories accommodate and allow for, and that is a, uh, an important critical 
um, advance that the kinds of religious studies scholars can bring to the table to not reify things too much, to not uh, turn it into a nice, easy flowchart like um, I, I think sometimes uh, humans are wont to do. Um, but at the same time, there is a reality there, a, a social reality, that um, if you're going to engage as a foreign policy actor, you need to understand. And one way to do that is to understand that the broad diversity of actors include uh, religious actors. Um, so I think the office in attempting to understand how to better across the board uh, how the State Department can better um, implement an understanding of uh, the role of religion within the um, affairs on the ground and in, in the policy that is being set by the national counterparts to the U.S. and then to better, under, to better train and equip um, foreign policy professionals and diplomats in how to engage in those, uh, how to engage with those religious communities, how to help them um, and equip them to come to the policy table and inform policy so that uh, that uh, policy is is developed in a more sophisticated uh, manner. I think these are all um, good things. But this lingering question that's out there is that somehow this is a, uh, a runs counter to our constitutional tradition. If not, is actually unconstitutional. Now, why do I make that distinction? Um, there, there was a good piece on the imminent frame uh, uh, blog discussion about uh, the launch of the office um, by a, a friend, uh, Winnie, Winifred Fowler Sullivan, who emphatically stated at the, at the start, this does not pose a constitutional problem in terms of its legality, but it runs afoul of a kind of constitutional culture where we do not, uh, as, a, as a nation, um, pick and choose and prefer, and also do not um, uh, engage in uh, preferential treatment of certain kinds of um, uh, religions one over another. Um, but lots of people, including official State Department policy, has for a, in the USAID, I think, is uh, uh, where you see this policy um, laid out most clearly, has for a long time assumed that engagement with religious communities. Um, is walking, always walking an extremely thin line that um, generally will fall into some kind of preference and promotion of a, of a sectarian purpose. And the, the, so I just want to spend two minutes sort of sketching in the briefest of fashion um, why I think that is actually false so that we can put that part of the argument aside. Um, the, the, the bottom line is that in the Establishment Clause jurisprudence, um, the only thing that's left of a possible challenge to governmental action that you as a taxpayer thinks might run afoul of um, the Establishment Clause is if there is in the government action an express congressional mandate and uh, essentially a line item in the budget for the action that you think is funding religion in a way that is inappropriate. Um, this happened over the course of 25 or 30 years, starting with uh, uh, a case called um, Valley Forge in which the government was distributing um, excess property and religious, and religious schools were getting uh, some of the property, and a taxpayer said, wait, you can't give this property to taxpayers because it's promoting those ta that uh, religious school's uh, uh, sectarian purpose. And in that case, the Supreme Court said, well, what the congressional mandate actually did was just say to um, the, the, the secretary of the agency that you could disperse this. It didn't say that you had to give it to religious schools. And in that regard, they said that the taxpayer standing sort of was um, diminished. And this got further um, reified in uh, 2007 in one of Justice Alito's first opinions um, called Hind v. Freedom from Religion Foundation, where there was a taxpayer challenge to the 
distribution of funds to what they perceived as evangelical communities as part of the uh, previous Office of uh, Faith-Based and Community Partnerships. And at issue there was whether or not the taxpayer funding um, was going to promote sectarian religious groups getting uh, religious or getting federal money that were essentially for praise, you know, they'd bring people into hotels and have essentially praise and worship services and all kinds of other things. And people thought, well, this is stupid to be spending taxpayer money for this, when what the, the office was doing was engaging these domestic uh, people, to uh, the domestic groups, to um, get them into the pipeline to get the grants and these sorts of things. And Alito's opinion basically said, look, what this money is, is discretionary executive money. It goes into a pool of money to fund an agency, and there's no congressional line item in about what that money is supposed to be spent on. And the only thing that the court has ever upheld as a taxpayer standing basis is if Congress has acted very specifically to fund a very specific item. And so Alito's opinion basically, I think, reified this idea that unless Congress explicitly funds it, there's no real challenge to an executive discretion uh, uh, expenditure. Now, couple that in the context of foreign affairs, which Tony could talk about um, uh, ad infinitum, um, the realm of executive conduct abroad done under the aegis of the State Department and other agencies, primarily the State Department, I think would fall under a rather large um, blanket um, uh, area of non-review by the court um, in, in this context. So given that, um, I think the, that the likelihood that there's ever going to be a case about something like the Office of Community uh, uh, Faith-Based Community Initiatives um, challenging its legality I think is probably very uh, is probably very small, if not nil. So that leaves us with this. So the legality of it, I think, is kind of established in some ways by um, the the backward circuitous method of our constitutional structure, which is that unless somebody can really challenge it, it sort of gets to stand. Um, so that leaves us with this larger question, uh, it, which is really a question of political theory. Um, and, and, and culture and American culture as to whether or not this kind of engagement run, somehow runs afoul of our deeper principles. And in that regard, I think that then in some ways just reproduces the same kinds of tensions that we were just talking about in the context of the State Department, that there's some people who see that culture as increasingly diverse and plural and um, non-sectarian and uh, explicitly non-endorsing of any particular religious view. So they may have deep trouble with an office that goes around the world and says, hey, I'm going to meet with the Mormon leader, and I'm going to meet with the, the Afghan tribal leader, and I'm going to meet with this, with the Pope, and um, versus a, a, a cultural uh, view in which um, religion is part of the fabric of these societies and religious leaders have influence and religious leaders can be important social um, change and transformative leaders and some of them work for things that the US uh, government would find as part of their strategic um, initiatives and some would work against those things and so the idea that um, our culture would somehow mandate that the government can't deal with social leaders uh, because they are somehow part of a religious um, group. I think th that group of people would find that that sort of puzzling, troubling, kind of downright stupid. So um, I guess I say, I, pro I mean, I'll just throw my cards out. I probably side with um, the latter a little more, although with all the caveats that the, the category of religion is a deeply complex one that, that, that needs to constantly be dynamically um, challenged and reshaped, but that doesn't mean that we can't act in any way. So um, with that, I'm going to ask you the question about um, the concept of religion and how, as foreign policy professionals, would you approach that? Um, and, and I'm curious if that maps on at all to the way religious studies scholars would treat that. 
Right. Um, I would say from, a, from the perspective of foreign policy making and developing policy in the most effective way to advance U.S. interests, which is the point of the State Department, to exclude categories of people and not understand fundamental driving forces that cause people to drive for peace or to drive for war is ignorant. I mean, it, 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 it confounds me that we're having a debate so in, which, <laughs> it, no, in which we would say that there is some level of political correctness, that we wouldn't entrust an officer to go into, the, into, a, into a conversation and have a conversation with a pastor or an imam or a rabbi and, and be able to do that in a way which doesn't endorse that religion. It confounds me that we don't trust our diplomats or our diplomats don't trust themselves to say, I could sit down and basically collect intelligence. It doesn't sound bad. It's just is talking to people and getting what they think. Um, collect intelligence from them so that I can be a better policymaker. And I'm going to exclude a group of people because what drives them is a god as opposed to what drives them is a market or what drives them is their ethnic group or what drives them is something else. It, it, it doesn't make sense. I understand it's very complex and I understand that there are gray lines, that there are, there are difficult, I won't say red lines, we don't say that, um, but there are, there are lines which can be crossed. But I think it would be far um, better for our society to say it makes sense to engage and let's figure out how we stay out of this gray zone than to live in this fear that we'll get to this gray zone and to completely mm. stay out of it. Mm. it. It's illogical, which basically means we've waged wars in Iraq <laughs> and Afghanistan where you got to understand religion. We are dealing with Iran and nuclear negotiations. We are trying to stay in and out of Syria, depending on what day of the week it is, which is rife with that. We have a pope who speaks to a billion people who is potentially tr changing what we talk about as far as poverty alleviation, and we're fearful that we might endorse somebody. It's, it's a little bit, to me, we're missing all of this analysis, all of this intelligence collection, all of this useful stuff because we're fearful of this gray, so we're going to stay over here, and that doesn't make sense. Likewise, the, the quote that you read started with the discussion of religious freedom and religious persecution. This country was founded by people who sought to escape religious persecution. All of what our first documents said spoke to the rights and the human rights and the civil rights that this country was founded on. If we were, in the, in the case of religious persecution, which is what she's talking about, fearful to stand up because there's an imam who is in jail being tortured because they are an imam, or there is a pastor in jail who's being tortured because they're a pastor. If we are fearful out of our Washington political correctness to say, you're being persecuted because you believe in this God and we think that's wrong, then we've really, we've really lost our direction, I think. Well, I agree with a lot of what Nicole has to say. I think actually the bigger contextual problem for our diplomats is that even though we know that diplomats shouldn't be talking only to other countries' government officials, we still really haven't gotten into a world where we have operationalized the premise that diplomats need to engage civil society, whether it's secular actors in civil society or religious actors. I'm, I'm in fact thinking of teaching a course on diplomats engaging civil society for this very reason. So it, it's part of a, a larger um, issue of discomfort. Um, so there are some nettlesome problems to, uh, on uh, you know, implementing a policy of engaging uh, on the question of religion or religious actors. So to take the specific case of religious freedom, um, you know, if there's an ambassador for international religious freedom at the State Department or a head of this office, if one were to have the suspicion that that person cared really only about the religious freedom of Christians in the world mm -hmm. and didn't care about Muslims or Tibetans, then that would be a problem. And I've actually heard people who've held these positions accused of just that. That is a problem. Mm -hmm. And there are specific questions you have to ask is, what is a religious group? Do you fight for the rights of Scientologists as a matter of religion? 
or is it just a matter of civil liberties more generally? Uh, the former executive director of uh, Amnesty International USA, um, William Schultz and I, co-authored an article about a new consensus on human rights policy. And one of the things we said that left and right needed to come together on was to mainstream religious issues into the di dialogue about human rights. My suspicion is that State Department officials and people who are sort of part of the chattering classes are uncomfortable focusing on, on religious issues, they'd like to set it aside and, and not mainstream it. The record uh, of you know, the way government is set up is if you want to heighten a focus on an issue, unfortunately you do have to set, sep have separate out the function. Have a, a watchdog, a dedicated office, and maybe eventually down the road it can be more mainstreamed into the overall thinking of uh, policy making. Could you all address some of the, the logistical challenges? I think it built off your, your last comments. Um, some people are concerned that the creation of an office like this actually works counter to the, the goal of trying to get religion across the board at the State Department. It ghettoizes it, it. It ghettoizes it or it silos it in the way that the Office of International Religious Freedom in some ways was, was um, structured at, at de facto, whether it was intended for that or not. Right there, there, there are reports of long-standing, if not tensions, but uh, sometimes uh, frictions between that office and and uh, you know other regional and 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 uh, and other human areas. rights <laughs> bodies right. of the State Department. Right. So, in some ways, it seems that the way Secretary Kerry rolled this out, not long after coming on board, to. Uh, you know, sort of took a morning and, and rolled it out. And, um, you know, uh, the director, Sean Casey, sits on the seventh floor. He's part of the, you know, he's part of the principal's um, uh, group. That, you know, he's not kind of off over here. He's sort of at the center of um, of the action. Um, that seems to, to be a signal that this needs to be across the board at the highest levels in, in every, you know, th these sets of issues need to be integrated and everybody needs to pay attention to that. Um, so from practitioner's standpoint, what are, what are the, the, the next challenges? What are the next dangers that somebody like Sean might, might encounter? I think it's a great start having the secretary roll it out, being on the seventh floor, which is the floor of the principals and the undersecretaries and the deputy secretaries, um, is good. But what, it, what is really going to matter is where the rubber hits the road, which is when the, um, under, when the assistant secretary for the Middle East issues, for example, the Near East Asian, a uh, Near East, um, Asian, Near East Bureau, um, is looking at where are they, how, what's their strategy? Who are we going to engage to inform is anybody checking whether religious groups are part of that? Is Sean going to be at the table in that discussion? When our ambassador in country X is out there or political officer is out there, is anybody, when they're doing their evaluations or when they're at a round table, asking the question? And if nobody is, then that rollout will soon fade. And I think that will be the question. The reality is the only person who can consistently ask that question right now is Secretary Kerry. Mm -hmm. And when the bureaucracy realizes, my gosh, that question is coming again, I'm going to have to do it, mm -hmm. they will start changing. But until they realize, we went through the same thing, and it's not just religion. Colin Powell came in and said, management matters. Being good managers matter. And everyone was like, great, and you'll be out of office when? <laughs> until he started asking, what management course did you take? What did you do to train your staff? What did you do to promote people who had good management skills? And people started to say, my goodness, I'm not going to get my ambassadorship until I ans answer those questions. If you're able to answer, if the questions are asked and they are answered, it'll change. Otherwise, culture doesn't change. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting question about when an office is, is located centrally, has the ear of the secretary, what happens when the that secretary disappears. I, I know this is a question on a, on a secular issue asked by the people in, in the human trafficking office. They found that Hillary Clinton was constantly asking them, give me the talking points so that when I talk to the foreign minister of a counterpart country, I could raise issues about human trafficking. 
it doesn't matter that the office exists if if it's if its work is not being pulled into the you know the core mm -hmm. um, of of diplomacy. You raise a classic issue in bureaucracies, and uh, let me take an example from a different quarter, um, the the UN. If you want to make sure that gender is the focus of work of the UN, is the right thing to do to amalgamate four different agencies that had existed, um, different offices, and put them all into one um, so that there's a focal point on this? Or does that create a message for different people in the UN bureaucracy? Well, UN women as the agency, they're going to take care of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think. In the end, I'm a, I think the record indicates that the existence of a standalone office or coordinator, um, whether in the State Department or in the UN, is in fact the instrument of things becoming regular order business as opposed to ghettoization. So uh, one last question, and we can open it to the audience. And I want to come back to this um, idea that somehow this office, I want to give the, the, the most radical skeptics view of this. Um, which is in some ways that what this office does is instrumentalize religion th to um, become uh, an instrument of, of US foreign policy. So that in fact, it, this isn't an establishment clause problem, this isn't religion as culture problem, this is sort of we are, we're going into the last vestige of you know, sort of what's sacred in human life and trying to find those people that can work for us and help them and support them and partner with them. And that that somehow is, um, that is really laid bare what this, what this is. Um, we've been talking largely about the office as uh, the kind of engagement mechanism and the, the kind of conduit to the secretary, which um, sounds a lot better. But is that what's, is that, when you push all the way down, is that what's there? That it's just an instrumentalization? Do you want to take that? I can, I'm you can jump in and I'll form my thoughts. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I think, it, uh, uh, I think the attraction um, to a number of, of diplomats and government officials is, is you know, using um, religion, engagement of religious actors as a, as a means, and that there are, there are larger goals. There will be, I think, political actors on Capitol Hill and uh, in, in any administration who want to raise up the importance of the voice of the actors so that they have uh, a larger role in the process. But I, I think it's always going to be uh, a danger that there's an instrument, uh, instrumentalization um, of these issues. I mean, after all, I mean, I think this is part of Nicole's argument is that it's crazy to leave out mm -hmm. this actor, this set right. of means, um, mm -hmm. this dimension um, of the policy. Um, and it, that they are instruments um, is not necessarily a horrendous thing in that if only secular instruments and secular actors uh, are, are used, then that's actually a worse situation. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that, you know, let these be our worst problems that we get to. You know, let it be that we are so worried about instrumentalizing. I mean, right now we're talking about can we even get this issue on the table? Um, I also think it's a two-way conversation. If someone feels that they don't want to engage with the US government, they don't have to. Um, and we don't have these questions about if you're engaging a political party in a country, ooh, are they going to feel like I'm being, you know, mm -hmm, that they're being mm -hmm, instrumentalized? Mm -hmm. Well, to some extent, you're engaging the US government. You are, because I'm, I'm getting information out of you. And if you don't want to, then don't meet with them. But, but what, I, what I find interesting is there are 150 excuses why not to do this, and as though this is going to be a perfect engagement. I would say, let us engage and then worry about instrument to light that issue um, once once it gets to that point. And that relationship will work itself out um, as time goes on. Great. OK, so if we have uh, questions, I just ask that you state your name and uh, your affiliation to the university or, or uh, other institution. Please try to keep it brief, because we'll have a number of um, questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm Peter Kovac. I'm the former director of the Office of International Religious yep. Freedom and retired but still very active in these interfaith questions. I think, you know, you're, 
there's some things that I felt were overstated in the discussion, but some things I think you, you, you kind of found the golden mean. Uh, and I didn't get here on time because of a medical emergency in my family. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. But um, I think that the first of all, the USERF, the religious freedom thing. Yeah, it's it's an oddball arrangement, but you know I was determined to make it work well, and re recognizing that USERF can call things as they see them. They are unencumbered. Uh, their board is more notional. Uh, they can follow the interests of one faith in particular if that person on the board is particularly strong. Uh, and at state, I think our report is, is the gold mine. The, mm -hmm. the religious freedom report is objective. I think mm -hmm. the questions are good. Uh, it, it, whatever we do or don't do with it at times, and, you know, maybe guilty is accused there, it's a great thing. Uh, we have to try to uh, embed these issues into our bilateral diplomacy. I think that the further incorporation of my old office into the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor is a positive. Some of the people in the religious freedom community, I know, disagree with me. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is, I agree with you, Nicole, that, that the success of Sean's enterprise is going to depend on a top down dynamic, but he particularly recognizes, and I'm really pleased to report that that it's creating a culture among foreign service officers, and I would say hmm. particularly political officers and public diplomacy officers, of comfort level with going out and engaging the significant group of civil society actors when it's important, right. when it serves a secular policy. Right. And you, you, I know, are vaguely familiar with the rewritten aid guidelines and the regs uh, from the early Bush administration, the early mm -hmm. part of W's uh, tenure, uh, really good regulations. They make sense. They put centrally, in pursuit of a secular policy goal, all partnerships and so forth, uh, they dictate, and I think this is the most important fine line, they dictate separation of the activity if we partner with a faith-based organization from in either time or space from the religious purpose of that organization. Okay. But we don't meddle in their structure, we don't meddle in their boards, we don't meddle in their hiring. They can have crosses, they can have uh, you know, Torah arcs, uh, uh, whatever, in the room that the activity is carried out. And it makes a lot of sense. And they compete on a level playing field with secular organizations. I, I think that's, that's a huge improvement. And I really, if anyone has an interest in the minutia of these, it's about six pages of regulations, including commentary and rebuttal by the USAID lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you, the interagency takes this as sort of legal gospel now. Mm -hmm. uh, I delivered a course for USAID, but it, we had commerce, state, DOD, uh, agriculture people in that course frequently. Um, I think that uh, the bottom line, and I'll, I'll shut up, is, is the culture. It's getting the right training. and. We made a big mess of it. We were going in a better direction, frankly, four years ago when I headed the office. Uh, Sean recognizes this, and he is working hard on it. He knows that's the deliverable. Uh, it, it's getting people over this rationalistic culture. Oh, you know, whatever tradition I was brought up in, I passed the foreign service exam, and mm -hmm. I'm a rational, highly educated person. And oh, yeah, that, you know, the, you know okay, I was a Muslim, or I was a Jew, or I, you know, but that's so much just at home at Thanksgiving or something. There's a lot of that. And then the bureaucracy has its own culture that's a bit antithetical, in that we're problem solvers and we go out to our embassies and we want to engage the people who think most like us. There's mm -hmm. rationalist, logical, empirical problem solvers. Got out to Yemen, my first post, and I'll shut up. Uh, first post, right out of Arabic school, and um, some of the really great Arabists in the department who were my bosses. And I'm looking at the first dinners and receptions, and I'm looking at these people, and they all seem to be the Yemenis with degrees from the States, the UK, even the Soviet Union, and even Baghdad, which were the four main uh, educators of Yemenis. And I'm thinking, this isn't what I learned Arabic for, and this isn't what I'm a public diplomacy officer for. I joined to deal with people that may have foggy perceptions about us. And whether they agree with our policies or not, I want them to accurately understand us, our values, our policies, and engage. And I went out, and I was the first diplomat, apparently Arab or Muslim or otherwise, to ever visit the, the Ikhwan, the two Ikhwans mm -hmm. in Sana'a. 
it's a Zadie and Sony. And I got a lot of, I mean, eventually there's a real program payoff for that. So it's, it's a struggle. Yeah. Well, thank you for, thank your, you for uh, that. For sharing your, uh, your depth of experience, uh, it adds something. And um, I, the one thing I, the one thing I'll just say in relation is that the the uh, you know it was just recently announced that a new ambassador at large for religious freedom, uh, or that there will be a new ambassador at large for religious freedom, and I think that um, appointment is going to be uh, highly visible and uh, crucial to understanding the relationship between the office and the, uh, the post of the ambassador at large and um, the new office of uh, faith-based community initiatives and how those three interact. Um, and you could imagine all kinds of scenarios in which, you know, who, who reports to whom? Are they all part of one umbrella? Do they, can, do they maintain siloing? And I th my sense is that it's going to maintain some separation for good reason. And I think with the, the, the depth of the conversation that has taken place over the last 15 or 20 years about religious freedom and the office and the commission and all of these things, it's probably a good thing that Sean's office is not going to get mired down into those conversations, but be able to operate um, separately, although collaboratively with those things. Hey, yeah, well, just a couple of thoughts prompted by your you know, very um, interesting observations and, and your comment there. Um, <clears throat> if, if you want to place um, a focus on faith-based actors and religion more centrally uh, in the culture at the State Department. I actually don't think the main agent for doing that is the Foreign Service Institute and a class on it. I think you should have the training and it should be there, but I think that there need to be some incentives in mm -hmm, mm -hmm, someone's mm -hmm. promotion mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that will reinforce that mm -hmm. you know, they will not be seen as bucking the system. And what, the way that happens actually I think is more one-on-one -on -one mentoring, that a senior diplomat stakes her or his reputation on focusing on these things and shows to the younger ones that you can, can succeed. Um, there's an interesting question about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing if, if one of these ambassadors or envoys is created by Congress. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it protects them because it places them more permanently in the bureaucracy, but it does tend to create resentment um, on the part of both career diplomats and some senior political appointees. I remember having a deputy secretary of state um, point to me and say, you're one of these people created by Congress, and even though you're doing a pretty good job professionalizing your office, I hate these things foisted on us by Congress. Um, they are barnacles. Barnacles. <laughs> and that's for those who are trying to eradicate the slavery of human beings who are being bought and sold every day. That's the culture you're up against. I mean, that's the challenge, is rather than saying, gosh, what you're, what you're striving for, whether you got here by Congress or elsewise, otherwise, um, you know, that, that there's a cultural bureaucratic mm -hmm. protectionism that is important to understand. My name is David Hollenbach. I'm uh, here at Georgetown uh, from Boston College, where I'm normally the director of our Center for Human Rights, but I'm here for the year. Good to be with you. Excellent. And Welcome. I'd like just to raise a question with Nicole, if I could. Please. You talked about the importance of sort of intelligence to the State Department about what's going on with regard to religion. <clears throat> um, let me ask you about what you think might be possible beyond intelligence mm -hmm. in terms of, of advancement of, say, religious groups that are working on poverty alleviation. You mentioned that. Let's say USAID or or some other branch in the in the government is really trying to say we've got to move. We really have to move toward trying to find ways to deal with the problems of poverty in Africa or something of this sort. Engaging religious communities. Or if we're trying to say we want to approach the issue of peace in country X uh, and religious actors are players in the peace or war situation there, what, what, what about moving into trying to engage people on that level from a religious point of view in the development of policies that might, or not just U.S. policies, but multilateral policies that might lead toward greater peace. I, I'm wondering what you think about that. I mean, that's beyond what you're pleading for, which is at least to try to learn what's going on. Absolutely. I'm saying that, it, that there are significant actors out there 
that are already doing things who are religious? And Absolutely. what about the engagement with the action that's going on there, not just learning about the knowledge? Of Abs the Absolutely. And, and I appreciate you raising that because I in no way wanted to underestimate the absolute importance of that. Faith-based organizations are making a tremendous impact in poverty alleviation, humanitarian assistance and relief, human rights, women's rights, um, peacemaking, and to exclude them from the process is, is a huge loss of tremendous knowledge and tremendous resources. The truth is in many situations, studies have shown actually that faith-based organizations are able to enter into some situations that other organizations are not able to because their faith, even if it's different than the target population, the client population, is different there is an element of credibility that they bring because they're perceived mm -hmm. as coming in for um, a higher purpose as opposed to organizations which are seen as working for the secular UN or secular U United States. And they have been able to, in many situations, get into and provide life-saving and essential assistance that other organizations have not been able to. I don't say that to say that they should get a better status, but I say that to say when USAID or someone is looking at how do we get food out or how do we reach HIV age needed people, um, they need to look at all of the assets that people are bringing to the table. Many Catholic organizations, for example, can walk into a country and they have implementing partners and partners in far reaches just by virtue of having Catholic churches in so many different corners. It's a tremendous, tremendous resource. Um, I would love to see, I'm not um, assuming this will happen before the end of the year, but I would love to see there be more recognition among the organizations, either governmental or, or um, multilateral, to look at religious peacemaking, okay? Mm -hmm. Just as a concept of how that concept of reconciliation that many different traditions bring to the table um, has been t hugely effective in many countries in bridging situations where you think two parties or more can never come back together. But there is the possibility, and it's based on people's beliefs. And it's not necessarily one that I would necessarily uh, agree with or would necessarily have in my personal life, but it's effective. And there's a reason that it's effective, and it's something that if we ignore it, we're missing out on yet another tool that can bring us peace or bring I us agree solution. With that basically, but it, it raises a further question about it does. the kind of establishment or <coughs> quasi establishment cultural dimension about knowledge about religion is one thing, but engagement with religious actors is something a bit beyond that. And that raises another set of questions that can sure. constitutionally, or let's say the the cultural fallout from the constitutional question emerges there in a way that may not go, might not when you're just talking about knowledge of what they're what's going. On. Sure, I but here's an illustration of this that I, I think it doesn't answer to a hundred percent degree, but it it does go some way. the The wisdom of the court's position on this, I think, the position crafted from a number of cases, um, is that. The determination about who makes the best partner on the ground, who's delivering the best aid, is really a policy, a discretionary um, matter that that can't be jurisprudentially reviewed, right? Um, so the, the 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 actual case that got um, decided that that upheld taxpayer standing and shut down a program at USAID. Um, was uh, an act of Congress called American Schools and Hospitals Abroad. And the, the Congressional Act simply, this case was 1991 uh, at the appellate level, uh, Lamont v. Woods. Um, the, 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 the Congressional Act just said it's a strategic objective of the U.S. government to help create schools and hospitals in foreign contexts to achieve all kinds of strategic foreign policy objectives. So Congress didn't say who to go out and, and how to fund them. But the State Department looked around and when on the ground realized that in some areas, the people trusted the nuns. So instead of going in and creating, and in some places I'm assuming, they went in and tried to create a school and nobody came to it or nobody would trust it. But the nuns, they, so the, the State Department partnered with the nuns and they created a- the Jesuit High School in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And, and there, were, there were schools in Israel, in Korea, in Jamaica, um, uh, across, uh, there were 29 schools at issue, 
And the, the, the court was concerned, in that case, they simply acted like it was a domestic context and they said there's too much entanglement and there's an endorsement of religion and so therefore, um, the, I, I don't think that case could be upheld now because of all the standing issues that I, that I was talking about, but there's never been a challenge to that case. So in some ways it's kind of good law and it made the State Department and the USAID rewrite the uh, AID uh, regulations about this, and then when they were recrafted, there was this sort of attempt to do the separation between the religious organization and the and the actual aid delivery. But in this context, it's just the government saying we want to do something that really is st a secular strategic objective: provide food, provide medicine, and the best partner. Is, who the best partner is is really uh, uh, that's what we have an executive uh, for with. The, with the minions and the agencies, um, but I do think there are all of the the, the concerns. <laughs> yeah, right. it's just a concern about how uh, that is there some kind of draconian line drawing versus what are the safeguards that could be put in place right. over time while still gaining all the benefits that Nicole was talking about. So, um, sir. My name is Iqbal Khan, and I'm from Ahmadiyya community, a Muslim community, and I have a simple question. Uh, you just mentioned about religious peace making. When you start promoting one particular group of religion in some country, some troubled country, and, uh, and, and the other groups are annoyed, so how do you level it up? How do, how do you iron it out? There's problem that you, some other groups are hating you and some, some are liking you. Mm -hmm. It's an excellent question with a not easy answer. Um, but what I think it argues for is a deep, deep, deep understanding on the part of the State Department as to what's going on. Because I think not understanding it is where we've been. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we then come in and say, okay, well, you're the first person I meet, so I'm gonna support your group. Not the best. Or, this is very common. I love when it says, secular blah, 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 selected to do something. As though secular inherently mm -hmm. means better, okay? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they might be better and secular. Sometimes they would be better and Christian. Sometimes they would be better and Muslim. They could be anyone. But it, it's as though that label inherently, when you're a reader of the Washington Post, it inherently gives some sort of credibility. I think it requires someone to go in and understand every single every single tenant of each faith, every single dynamic within the faith communities, because there's a ton in with, within each, how, what's the demographic, who, who's the party players, who is the, who's the imam, what does he think? Then you, can, then you can figure out who is the best peacemaker. And there may be a peacemaker mm -hmm. from a completely outside group, secular, other, or other, who can come in with the credibility. But until you understand what's going on the ground, you can't see who will be credible to all of the actors. And there is an award who wins. There's an award who wins. Yeah, that's a whole <laughs> separate difficult. <laughs> Hi, my name is Walt Racer. I work for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops for 26 years and was an advisor for religious freedom and international religious freedom and human rights. Uh, so you've got a cluster of questions here. So part of my experience uh, coming partially out of the Balkans and dealing with the State Department is you do have these questions of cooperation, who's best on the ground, how my concern is the challenge of uh, two things. One is when we disagree, like with the U.S. government, and of course, State Department has to promote the interests of the U.S. government. And so handling those disagreements around there, and then on the ground, I know like in the Balkans, the great concern by the State Department about the international conflicts and so forth, but at the same time, trying to push like how they wanted, in, in this case, I was dealing with Carlo Puig, how they wanted the Catholic Church in the Croats to operate and so forth. So it's a question for me of what's that balance of, of cooperation, of getting work done and so forth, but where you, how far you push U.S. interest relative to particular religious groups, because we're not just carriers of you know, whatever you want, that's what we're going to carry into the operation that our colleagues are receiving. So. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely fine line to, to, to balance, and I think that it needs to just be made clear going into the relationship that both sides are, are interested in it. There are places where the U.S. government wants an implementing agent to be absolutely almost the face of the U.S. government. And some secular, religious, other groups say, we're not, we're not into that. We're, that's not who we are. And that's fine. But there may be other situations where they say, okay, 
we understand that you are not the US government. You have your independence and you're going to operate different, differently. But I think what it takes is the, the US government to say, we need to make that clear and for the organizations to make that clear and that just to be part of the relationship. And I think that once there's a better understanding and a better integration, that balance can be struck and there'll be places where faith-based will want to partner and there'll be faith places where they say, you know, it's, it's, that's compromising on, on who we are or how we operate. I, you know, I, I, I do think that um, faith-based actors are special in some, some respects and bring some, some special uh, impact. It may, may not only be in peacemaking, but, uh, you know, programmatic work to, you know, fight poverty and fight, you know, major social problems. Um, but I, th I, I come back to my premise. I'm not really sure how different this is from any civil society actors that the U.S. government is trying to, to engage with. Um, anytime the U.S. government engages with some civil society actors, other civil society actors think that they're tainted or that the U.S. is putting their thumb on the scale between different actors. That, that's, that's always the case, and I'm not really sure why it's that different. There's, there's just an allergy to engaging religious actors that, that exists in the, the culture. Um, of the foreign policy making establishment. Great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, time for two more questions, uh, ma'am, and then uh, the gentleman in the back. Okay. Yeah. My name is Kathy Ward, and I spent most of my career in uh, both foreign service and civil service public diplomacy positions. Um, so, I've done a lot of engaging with civil society actors, and I think that that's really important. Um, I think that maybe this, some of this um, skepticism on the part of the State Department uh, goes beyond religion, um, and that's just really part of the bigger piece because within academia, religion is a discipline that's part of the humanities. The State Department is filled with social scientists, with political scientists, and economists, and so on. And if you're going to bring in something that's more of a humanistic element, that's always been a little bit of an unknown, I think, to some, some people. Hmm. It's realism. It's, religion, it's realism. Mm -hmm. You're talking about things like values formation. Yeah. You're talking about things like um, what motivates people, how your worldview is shaped, what you happen to think is the relationship of human beings to the rest of the universe. You know, those are all kind of squishy areas, mm -hmm. but they're not limited to religion. I mean, those are questions that are pursued by any of the humanistic disciplines in the arts, too. So I have a feeling that, that some of these issues really go beyond religion and the questions posed purely by religion. Um, and so I guess I'm uh, yeah. kind of turned to public diplomacy. I'm welcome. Can I actually jump in on, on that particular this is point? Your, this is your <laughs> because if I exercise a director's prerogative, I think you're absolutely right. If, if you will, the problem is realism. So realism as a dominant school of thought in international relations told us two things. One, domestic structures, values, domestic institutions don't matter. States behave how states behave irrespective of what's going on domestically. So it's, it's Ken Waltz, it's Henry Kissinger, it's, it's the whole gang. And realism says states are the primary actors in the international system. Diplomats should interact with states. Anything else is not a significant actor. And my view is that both those premises are absolutely incorrect. <laughs> Values matter. People are motivated by values. States are not these billiard balls out there. They're actually run by people. So one's religion, one's values, one's ethical system matters when you're running a state. Moreover, today, of course there are states, and states are major actors. But I think we're better off understanding the world in terms of a variety of actors that in some cases have more impact than states. We can't understand what's happening in the world right now unless we look at what the Pope is doing. We can't understand what the world is doing right now unless we look at what the OIC is doing or what Al-Qaeda is doing. And I think part of this is breaking this old paradigm that's absolutely necessary in training diplomats and other people that are going to interact in the international system. My colleague Mark Legon and I have opined, drawing on the British scholar Hedley Bull, that the international system is, is best understood as being neo-medieval. Yes, there are states, but there are a variety of other actors, and you got to deal with them or you don't understand reality. You're not actually being a realist. 
End of rant. No. <laughs> Great book coming out. <laughs> Great rant. Yeah. And the final question. Yes. Uh, I'm Amjajo Ali. I'm from Andrea Muslim Community. And this community has been based on the, the, uh, the process that uh, it will bring peace. Uh, this Andrea Muslim Community from very beginning, it set the state and religion is set it. And at this time, is the fifth successor is uh, truly uh, all around the world. He came to the, uh, the Capitol Hill, he delivered lecture, he came to the uh, European Union, he gave a lecture there, and he went to Australia and so many other places. Uh, uh, he had written a book in that regard. But what I'm saying is, you know, when you uh, go to the any other country or any other region, uh, you might be stumbled by so many things, like she was saying, that you know you have to deal with so many things. But the base fair communities, they should come up and they should show that they are valuable, that they can bring peace, uh, 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 justice, and these things. And that's what uh, we say. This uh, the uh, fifth caliph or fifth successor of the uh, we say the problem Saya had uh, the second coming of problem Saya had happened, and the fifth successor is doing the same thing that he is going all around the world, and he is uh, his uh, humanity first is the one that is going around and. <coughs> And these are the things that we are saying. Uh, this is the thing that the base faith community should do that, and uh, they can learn from. So some Thank of the, you. Some of this discussion, where my colleague Professor Kessler has said there's a, a concern about instrumentalization, turning faith-based actors into just mere means of foreign policy, is kind of. Um, Patronizing, you don't believe this, but if you have that view, it's patronizing um, because it doesn't give agency mm -hmm. to, to the actors. Mm -hmm. I t entirely agree with Nicole. Um, if faith-based actors don't want to engage with the U.S. government, they don't want to be part of a dialogue, they don't have to. And you are right to suggest that faith-based actors um, are going to be ones to demonstrate their value as peacemakers, as... Um, those who are solving social problems, um, I think the U.S. government is, 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 as my colleague says, ignorant if it yeah. does not try and engage those, um, you know, valuable actors. Yeah, if, if nothing else, this office's establishment sort of recalibrates the, the radio so that it tunes into better frequencies, right? I mean, it, what, it, what it essentially does is say, we're not going to be tone deaf in some ways. We're going to go into communities, and as Nicole said, we need to understand, right? And not all of those groups are going to be uh, are going to be um, wanting to engage. Some are going to be outright hostile, hostile, and some are going to be advocating positions that the U.S. government may not want to promote. But uh, but at, at as a, uh, a simple basis, there has to be an understanding of what that terrain looks like and who those actors are if you're going to insert yourself uh, and, and try to intervene and, and shape transformationally. So um, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, participating and, and uh, my fellow panelists. Um, thank you for coming and uh, have a good evening.